worship service of the Unitarian Universal Church of Riverside. Our doors are open and we will continue live streaming and posting these services on our YouTube channel for our virtual attendees. I am Linda Van Voris and I will be one of your worship associates today. Other members you will hear from include Dinah Rowe, our church treasurer. We welcome you to join us this morning with an open mind and an open heart and with muted electronic devices, please. We invite you to leave your worries and defenses at the door and trust that what happens in worship is, is inspiring and powerful. Together, we affirm that this day and our being together can make us, each of us, braver, more compassionate and wiser as we begin a new day and a new week. Although our doors are open, the pandemic is not over. So while we are here, please keep your masks on if you have not been vaccinated or, and socially distanced. We can speak in normal tones, but singing or chanting creates an increased risk of airborne exposure. So we ask you to refrain for the time being. And I need to ask Adam, do we have any idea when that's changing? Okay. We invite those of you in the sanctuary to sit back and enjoy listening. For those of you at home, sing your hearts out. We are happy to be joined today on Zoom by... Thank you. And now I invite you to sit back and take a slow, deep breath as we move into our worship hour. For our call to worship, you are welcome to read with me the mission statement of our church. Our mission is to foster a diverse religious community that celebrates life, affirms the individual, encourages spiritual growth and open thought, and works to advance social justice and environmental sustainability. I'm going to mention very briefly, for those of you who are fathers, grandfathers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, happy Father's Day. This is a time where we have the opportunity to acknowledge all of the hard work and the love and the time that our fathers and grandfathers, those and people who don't have our la that label, who are men who have done something to help us grow in life, to love us in life, to help us understand what the world is about and help us to grow as better people. Let's take a moment to contemplate and honor and appreciate the fathers and father figures in our lives who have played a part of shaping who we are today. This morning, we are pleased to welcome Joan DeArtemis, who will, speak, will be speaking to us about a new understanding of Father's Day. Joan DeArtemis currently resides in Massachusetts, where she is a candidate for ministry, an intern, and summer minister at UU Wesley Hills. She has once again agreed to be a regular speaker, and now we have Zoom to thank. Joan holds a BA in Religion and Society from Syracuse University, a Master of Divinity from Claremont School of Theology, and she completed four units of clinical pastoral education at the Yuma Regional Medical Center. While not practicing her craft of ministry, 
Joan spends her time with Kathy, her spouse and partner of 27 years, and Finley, their adorable Carrigan Welsh, sorry, Cardigan Welsh Cory puppy. Joan, Kathy, and Finley live in Worcester, Massachusetts. The city was the birthplace of both the birth control and the smiley face. No one can deny it, the world is changing rapidly. This is a time of extreme alterations in the very foundation of our culture. Recognized institutions may either disappear or be born afresh in a new form. The good qualities of our society are under stress and our personal human rights sometimes feel like they are under assault. This is a time of cultural deterioration, but anytime something dies, something new and alive sprouts in its place. So what do we do with Father's Day? What do we keep? What do we leave behind? Please join us this Sunday while I explore the possibilities and give ourselves permission to change and grow beyond our current limited understanding of what it means to be a father. We have two lightings of sacred flames. The first is the Occupied Indigenous Peoples Remembrance Scandal. The second is the lighting of our own chalice, the symbol of our faith. We walk upon the traditional territories of diverse and sovereign peoples, the original peoples of this land, who continue to cry out for justice and self-determination. This spot we occupy was the first sacred space of several groups of California Indians, instead of <laughs> including the Kahuya, the Capano, the Serrata, we, the Universalist Unitarian Church of Riverside, light this sacred flame as stewards of this sacred and holy place. We are blessed with a space and opportunity to strive to love out our common principles, to bring justice, equity, and compassion into our daily lives, to resist all that threatens the earth and her people, and to be part of a world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. Let these thoughts carry us forth as we journey and worship together. Joan will be reading um, today's chalice lighting reading, um, The Hands of Our Fathers. Today's reading of the chalice lighting is The Hands of Our Fathers. Our words for the chalice lighting are written from the perspective of Jessica Starr Rockers. Perhaps her specific memories will elicit your own. She writes, every Sunday morning growing up, my father would take us to, to mass at St. Peter's Catholic Church. I love the hymns and the smells and the bells, as they say, but the sermons were kind of a bore. So I would occupy myself by counting the cuts and scrapes and bruises on my father's hands. My dad was an electrician and a farmer, working with his hands from before the sun came up until long after it went down. So every week, I would take up his large hands in my little ones, turning them over, examining, discovering new bruises, and keeping track of the healing, <coughs> healing of the old ones. 
I would count the wounds and whisper the tally in his ear. I loved that he would let me hold and investigate his hands in that way. Snuggled up to ne next to him in the pew, in the quiet of the church, with just the priest's voice in the background. Having two jobs that demanded his attention, my dad didn't always have time for such intimacies, except on Sunday morning. And I took pride in those wounds. It was evidence of how hard my dad worked to take care of his family. He was a man who often uncomfortable with expressing affection, but I could see in those hands how much he loved me. Was my dad a good dad? Was he there for me when I needed him? Did he protect me and provide for me? Did he care about me? When I ask myself those questions, I think of his hands. We dedicate the lighting of our chalice today in honor of the hands of our fathers for all the ways and all the hard work that they do to show us that we are loved. Our opening hymn this morning is For All That Is Our Life. For those in the sanctuary, please sit back and enjoy the hymn. But please do not sit, sing along. For all that is our life, we sing our thanks and praise. For all life is a gift, which we are called to use, to build the common good. And make our own days glad. Needs which are the serve, for services we give, for work and its rewards, for hours of rest and love, we come with praise and thanks. For all that is our life, for sorrow we must bear. new thing we learn, for fearful loves that pass, we come with praise and thanks, for all that is our life, for all that is our life, we sing our thanks and praise, for all life is our gift. Calls to use to build the common good and make our own days glad. At UUCR, we like to welcome those who are visitors or perhaps returning after some time away. But we know it can be uncomfortable to stand up and speak in front of others, so we won't ask you to do something we wouldn't do ourselves. So I am going to choose some unsuspecting soul who has been here a while to tell us your name and how you first found out about our church. We ask you to hold the mic close to your face and speak directly into it and clearly so everyone can hear. And I'm going to pick um, Dinah. Good morning, my name is Dinah Rowe. My husband Bill and I have been members here since 2004. And before that, we were uh, at the Long Beach Church, in Unitarian Church in Long Beach.
That simple. I'd like to introduce our neighbors. They're sometimes California neighbors, and sometimes from Indiana, Sue and Al. They're here until July. They come down and honor us with their presence every once in a while. Sue and Al. For new guests, our visitor's book is in the parish hall. Please sign it before you leave so that we know you were here and can let you know about upcoming events. For those online, the best way to get added to the email list is to email to the church office at adminchurchofriverside.org. During the service, we will mention several websites, email addresses, and phone numbers. At the end of the service, we will leave up a slide with all this information, and it is also available on our website. Announcements. Sharing joys and concerns is one of the important rituals in our community, an opportunity to share milestones, losses, achievements, and experiences with one another. Now that our doors are open again, on the first Sunday of each month, we can both hear from those in the sanctuary and read the contributions we have received. In front of the pulpit, there is a book where you can write your joys and concerns whenever you are here in the sanctuary. For those of you at home, you can send your joys and concerns throughout the month to uuchurchofriverside at gmail.com. Our next Joys and Concerns will be on July 4th. The Social Justice Committee will be meeting today at 1 p.m. You can join us here next door in, in the parish hall with all the heat. Not next door. <laughs> Um, or on Zoom. I'm going to be discussing that with Adam after the service. Um, there will be a summer solstice ceremony on Monday, June 21st at 5 p.m. at Pack Wonders Home. This will be a potluck. Actually, what this is is a drumming circle event. Um, <coughs> we also will be acknowledging the social service. You do not have to be a follower, follower of any pagan um, spirituality. Um, you just have to be looking for community and connection because ultimately that's what a drum circle does. Um, if you don't have a drum or an instrument, I provide, oh, if there are not too many people, and there should, I should have enough, I provide the drums and other percussion instruments so that there's more than enough instruments to go all the way around. So everyone is welcome to come. And again, that's a potluck at 5 p.m. And then we'll do the drumming circle after. Please, anybody is welcome to join us. Hymn. Our hymn is now Spirit of Life. If you're in the sanctuary, I invite you to sit back Close your eyes and listen.
time of sharing our treasure. And Dinah Rowe will come up to speak to us about sharing our treasure. Good morning. This is part of our service with where we contribute to supporting our church. Other than supporting today, there are several other ways that you can support our church. Send a check to the church office, the address will be shown, or scan the QR code on the church website. We also have staters cards available each Sunday. I will have those with me. Uh, just another announcement is we're having a bake sale today after church, so you're welcome to contribute that way. Uh, will our ushers come forward, please? Our uh, next hymn is from You I Receive. Again, those in the church, enjoy the sound. You and Zoom, go for it. Our meditation today is More Truth Telling by Lee Ungry, and Joan will be taking over from here. So I will let her fix that pronunciation if she needs to. Thank you, Joan. More Truth Telling by Leah Ungry. Today, and on all other days, may we give thanks for the fathers, the papas, the pop pops, dads and daddies who represent for us the steadfast presence that holds us in love and launches us into the world. Whether we encounter it when we are small or already grown. May we be mindful of those for whom this day is complicated or irrelevant or even downright ugly. Some among us have no relationship with our fathers for whatever reason. Some of us have hard and broken edges separating us from our fathers. Some of us have longed to assume the role of father and never had the chance to take on its magic and its mystery. Some, of, some among us have fathered in ways that will never be recognized or appreciated, that will never be counted in any official reckoning. 
Amid the grief and the difficulty of this day, may we remember to see and revel in the people of all genders who love and support and nurture and parent and father. May our gratitude for the good and the healthy be a balm for the places of pain. May it point us in the direction of more truth-telling and more healing and more love and more connection on Father's Day and on all the other days. Now let us pause for a moment of silence. You know, when I was a kid growing up in the 1960s, the world seemed a lot simpler. Like a lot of kids, I had a mom and a dad. And most of the time, my dad went to work and my mom stayed home. I was born in the 50s, the era of Father Knows Best and Leave It to Beaver. The country was still recovering from World War II and it was still trying hard to find some sort of balance and stability. That generation solution was to put the men back to work and the women back in the homes. So there was a Mother's Day and a Father's Day. And just like the fact that both my mom and my dad had birthdays, we knew what to do with Mother's Day and Father's Day. On Mother's Day, I would always make something for my mom, a card or some crap thing. For Father's Day, my mom and I would go out and buy my dad a bottle of Old Spice. <clears throat> One year I got him a tie, and that was a flop because my dad never, ever wore ties. Ever. Truly, I never saw him wear a tie, even at my mother's funeral. I, I'm not even sure he knew how to tie a tie. Mother's Day was a day to show appreciation to my mom. Father's Day was a day I showed appreciation for my dad. It did not start to get complicated until about 1983. You see, by then, I was with my first female partner. And she had been married before, and she had a son. It was not an amicable divorce. So while the biological father did not want to pay child support, he still expected visitation rights, which his mom was very much resistant to. And there was a lot of tension and drama around this. And oh, he also did not approve of us raising his son in our deviant lifestyle. In the meantime, I was a sole breadwinner for the family, yet could not claim him as a dependent on my income tax, nor could I put the two of them on my health insurance at work. 
So I just paid for their medical bills out of my pocket. Did I mention that the biological father never paid his child support? So when that first Father's Day we were together came along, I was, shall I say, annoyed. You see, I was doing all the things for the family that I grew up believing that a father was supposed to do, yet the biological father was going to get all the credit and the appreciation. I felt like sort of a non-person, like, like a, some kind of robot that just got up and went to work every day, fed and housed the family, but had no real rights or privileges or any kind of status, really. Legally, I was just the roommate. Fortunately, my, my partner at the time picked up on this right away. And the two of them, two of them, she and her son, celebrated me for Father's Day, too. And now, they didn't ignore the biological father, but they did let me know that they appreciated what I was doing for them. And I appreciated that back in return. And my partner had an older brother, and they did something for him, too. He absolutely adored the little guy and bought him all kinds of stuff and spent a lot of time with him. So it, Father's Day was a day for him, too. Father's Day was the day that my partner's son appreciated his actual biological father, as well as his uncle, as well as his his Joan, because that was what he called me, his Joan, because there was no other word to describe what I was for him. The other thing that happened when I came out, I came out into a kind of a lesbian family. Now, mostly they were all former Girl Scouts that, that they all went to summer camp together growing up. But they kind of adopted me. And there was this one couple whose apartment we always met at. And one of them was older than the rest of us and taught Catholic school for a living. So she was pretty much in the closet when she wasn't with us. Because she was older and had known all of the other ones since they were teenagers, they all called her mom. Little did I know at the time, but what we were doing was something that was remarkably like the houses prevalent in drag ball co culture in New York City. The houses operate as chosen family units, mainly comprising of Black and Latino LGBTQ persons who are in the houses given refuge and comfort and security for those who have often been booted out of their families of origin due to being LGBTQ. They fund themselves by doing drag balls and have been doing this for years. Houses are headed by mothers and fathers who are typically elder members of the ballroom scene and who are usually drag queens, gay men, transgender women, and they provide advice and encouragement for their house children. The other members of the house call each other siblings. But we were not black or Latino. We were all young, working or middle-class white women. We did not need to all live in the same house in order just to have some place to live. But that did not mean that we did not have our struggles. And that apartment in Pasadena was a hub where we could always find sanctuary and support. Mom's partner was younger than her, actually younger than a lot of us. She had been a firefighter until someone found a, a copy of the Lesbian News in her locker and she got fired. Back then, you could still fire 
someone just for being gay. She was very much gender non-conforming. So it did not take long before we started calling her dad. Now this was mostly meant to be humorous, but we still had a Father's Day party for her and gave her gifts and let her know how much she meant to us too. And by the way, it was she that taught me how to tie a tie. Since, as I said, my bi biological father never wore one. I had other dads as well. I had a, a couple of work dads. You know, like people talk about having a work wife. Well, I had three work dads in my life. I used to work in a very male-dominated field. But I was fortunate to have, enough to have met these older men along the way that kind of took me under their wing and taught me how to do the job. I want to lift these guys up too because they made my life so much better. Now, here we are nearly 40 years later and we all live in a world that I almost don't recognize. You see, for me growing up, anyone did not anyone that did not fit squarely into the heterosexual cisgender norm was largely invisible. It was dangerous to be gay or lesbian or bisexual or trans or otherwise gender nonconforming. It was just last year, only last year in 2020, that the Supreme Court ruled that people could not be fired just for being gay or transgender. But when I was growing up, not only could one be fired, but beaten up or jailed. The world is now quite a different place for me when I was growing up. And I know a lot of people are just plain unimpressed by all the corporations sporting rainbow logos this June <clears throat> and all the same sex couples that show up in commercials nowadays. But I'm not. Call me an easy mark, but I find that I am in a state of wide-eyed amazement at the fact that instead of being threatened with job loss or even violence, major corporations, big corporations, seem to find it advantageous to align themselves with me. That's a nice change. Honestly, though, I, I'm not entirely sure why I find this so amazing. You see, I read a book back in 1983 called Positive Magic, a toolkit for the modern witch by a woman named <clears throat> Marion Weinstein. It turns out she wrote that book back in 1978. Anyway, remember that song from back in the 60s, Aquarius by the Fifth Dimension? Harmony and understanding, sympathy and trust abounding, no more falsehoods or derisions, golden living dreams of vision, mystic crystal revelation, and the mind's true liberation. Aquarius. Remember that? <clears throat> well, that came from a musical called Hair that opened in 1967 about hippie counterculture, the anti-war movement, the sexual revolution. That was all happening back then. And it was all like big scandalous news. Remember that age of Aquarius? Remember the new age movement? Well, even, even though I remember that song from growing up, I didn't know what it meant until I read Weinstein's book. You see, <clears throat> as she explained, we were leaving the age of Pisces, which is always depicted as two fish swimming in opposite directions, one above the other. She said that in the age of Pisces, was all about dualism, God and the devil, good and evil, light and dark, male and female, 
rich and poor, white and black. One always had to be on top and opposite of the one on the bottom. However, as Weinstein wrote in 1978, let me stress that, 1978, <clears throat> the dominant themes of Aquarius are equality and oneness with all life. Duality is not an Aquarian issue. Neither is the concept of higher or lower, winner versus lo loser, inner versus outer. There is no polarities. This can be seen in the Aquarian view of sex. The unisex style popularized during the 1960s was an Aquarian phenomenon. Men and women dressing alike, looking alike, acting alike. The gay movement, the women's movement, transsexualism, the open recognition of bisexuality, as well as homosexuality, are all Aquarian. In the Aquarian age, male will no longer be superior but neither will female. There will be equality and oneness between the sexes. In male-female relationships, sexuality is no longer considered lower than spirituality. Love includes sex. Instead of being able, instead of being seen as a contrast to it, the acceptance of open sexuality workshops and therapies, beginning with Masters and Johnson, legalized abortion, sex education, widespread birth control, the so-called sexual revolution, and the idea of sex as healthy. These are all Aquarian. Nuns wearing street clothes, women rabbis, married priests, gay churches, Aquarian. These are all direct, direct quotes from her book. Further, she predicted, Exploitation of the planet is an idea that grew out of Piscean dualities. Man as separate from God, human separate from the rest of nature. The Aquarian counterpart is environmentalism. Save the planet and revere nature because we are all inexorably linked to it. Now, here is possibly my favorite part. Pisces is a water sign, boat travel was the main Piscean means of exploration. Aquarius is an air sign. Airplane, airplanes, rocket ships, satellites are all Aquarian ways to explore space. Getting high on liquids was Piscean. Getting high on air, marijuana, is Aquarian. The major form of mass communication during the Piscean age was the printing press first owned by government and church, and then by big business. Communication through the air is Aquarian. Television, radio, telephones, phones, and cyberspace. Okay, that last word, cyberspace, it's only fair to mention that I copied that quote, that last bit of that quote from my Kindle edition of the book. My actual hard copy volume of this book, first published in 1978, that, that, that I originally read, that's in my storage unit in California. So I don't actually have access to that right now. I'm, I'm pretty sure she didn't actually use the word cyberspace in 1978, but the rest of it I remember. In fact, this thing that I always carry around, this little cell phone pocket computer that is more powerful than the room full of computers that put men on the moon. This is a constant reminder. It's all about the air. It's all about the airwaves. The age of Aquarius is here. Now, I know what you probably most of you were thinking. This astrology stuff is a lot of mumbo jumbo, and I don't see any way the planets can have anything to do with anything. And maybe they do, maybe not. But my point is, these extreme changes in our way of life, they did not just happen overnight. People have been thinking about them, talking about them, writing about them, dreaming about them for quite some time, envisioning them, 
making them manifest. Marion Weinstein was not the only person thinking about these things. It was alluded to in the musical Hair. In fact, Weinstein was not making any of this astrology stuff up either. She didn't just come out of come up with it out of thin air herself. She was drawing on the writings of occultists from the from the turn of the last century, like Aleister Crowley. In 1890, in an article in a French newspaper, Le Front, no, Le Front August Van de Kirchhoff, that's a name, Van de Kirchhoff, said that Aquarius was the house of the woman, and the age of Aquarius would be a time when women would be equal to men. He published that in 1890. Pre- Protestant Reformation astrologers said that there would be a new dark age when the age of Aquarius came. When the church, meaning the Catholic church, because that was the only church that they knew at the time, would lose its power and its preeminence in the world. Ooh, scary. Even if you do not believe in astrology, one cannot deny that we have collectively been moving in this direction for a very long time. One could even say that it is the very embodiment of our sixth principle, the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. But all of this is kind of making Father's Day a little complicated, if not downright obsolete. I mean, Father's Day, like Mother's Day, is so gendered. Astrology or not, language establishes and reinforces the status quo. What we say matters. If you're going to change the status quo, you have to change the language. Now, we are rapidly moving towards a non-gender, more equal, gender-neutral system. And Father's Day and Mother's Day, the terms just seem a little antiquated to me. To that end, some people are suggesting that we start using terms like gestational parent, and non-birthing parent. But that doesn't exactly roll off the tongue like mother and father. You know, gestational parent day and non-birthing parent day. I, maybe we should consider changing Mother's Day to Parents' Day, gender neutral. And Father's Day to Co-Parent Day, again, gender neutral. I do not have all the answers. But the point is, not all fathers are men. And not all mothers are women. And there are lots of non-binary people around. And they are doing the extremely hard work of parenting too. So if you're lucky enough to still have a dad or even a granddad that's still around, Call him for Father's Day. Buy him some Old Spice or a tie if he wears one. But do not forget to remember to think outside that box. Do you have any same-sex couples in your life who are parenting or acting as mentors to others? Or maybe some non-binary folks? Give us some thought. Maybe they would like to be recognized too. Or maybe like me, you have a work dad. He might enjoy, or she might enjoy, or they might enjoy a little thanks and recognition too. Remember when I said earlier that when I was a kid, the world seemed a lot simpler? Well, it was not. It was filled with a lot of gendered rules and expectations. 
that I, for one, just could not navigate. It was not simpler at all. And in fact, it was kind of cruel. So if you've never thought of this before, that's okay. Do not be hard on yourself. Everything is changing way faster than anyone expected. But we are all working on it. And just bring your best restorative, positive impact to the present. And you will be able to take away the ample praise that you deserve for the compassionate role that you have performed. So, happy Co-Parents Day. Have a wonderful Sunday. Our closing hymn is Love Will Guide Us. Those in the sanctuary, sit back, close your eyes, and listen quiet. in the Universe by Tom Shade. My friends, there is a power at work in the universe. It works through human hands, but it is not made by human hands. It is a creative, sustaining, and transforming power that, and we can trust that power with our lives and with our ministries. It will sustain us whenever we take a stand on the side of love, whenever we take a stand for peace and justice, whenever we take a risk, trust in that power. We are together held by that power. Ashe, Shalom, Amen, and blessed be. Thank you, Joan for sharing your valuable time and insights with us this morning. It is sincerely appreciated and we look forward to seeing you again. We are going to have about 10 to 15 minute Q and A with Joan following the service. Be aware, this will be included on the video that is posted. This is a transition for us, trying to figure out how to combine live and Zoom. So be, please be patient and we will figure it out. Thank you and have a good week.
So does anyone have any questions for Joan's um, <clears throat> sermon today? Pat, do you want to come up and, yeah, maybe that's the best way to do it. If anyone else has any questions, um, you could maybe come up to the front so that it'll be easy for you to come and speak in the mic. I don't actually have a question, I have a comment. Joan, I really loved what you said. That was a really interesting talk. Having lived through those periods, I thought that was an amazing summary of the changes. But I was thinking I'd like to have Mother's Day replaced with Caregiver's Day Hello, and dear. Father's Day replaced with Mentor's Day. Those are good for me, that's, I'm sorry? Those are good selections. I like those ideas. Yeah. Well, it's when I think about the many um, gifts I've gotten from people, mentors and caregivers, um, I'm really touched. And yeah, they are male and female. They are younger than me, older than me. It's all complicated, but yeah. there really are roles. I and mean, a caregiver role is an amazing role, I think. Anyway, thanks for listening. Thank you. That's a good idea. I know a, a man who's a really good caregiver right off the top of my head. And um, maybe I'll send him something for Mother's Day. Also, more of a comment than anything, you know, as uh, a uh, person who's getting a bit older and single, there's that moment where, as you mentioned, that moment where you somehow missed the boat on becoming a father, and it can feel pretty bad sometimes. You know, uh, it's a, like, you know, you had one genetic job to do and you somehow messed it up. And uh, so you can sit there and look and treat it like, you failed somehow or you can also turn it around like just yesterday uh, an acquaintance of mine had a relationship that was breaking really badly she's going to be going out of state soon and i was able to just talk to her a few things about how to handle the breakup in such a way as to keep from having the ex who was somebody who it sounded like you did not want to have in your head i was able to give some advice and an angle or so just from the point of view of an older person who's seen some of these head games played before and just being able to advise someone especially around this time of year when you start feeling like there's still usefulness for you humans have a genetic predisposition to write themselves out of the game of existence because our ancestors because we still carry around caveman behaviors stuck to our DNA. And, you know, you write yourself out of the game sometimes. You set yourself up for mortality. And there's no earthly reason to do it. There's still room to advise, to support, to give the best advice you can, and know that you're shedding your light into the world and making it a better place. Yeah, um, the three men that I have in my past that uh, mentored me in my work life, all three of them, none of them had had children of their own. And I feel like I was the beneficiary of that. You know, my dad taught me how to do practical things growing up. And then I went from one workplace to another and kept finding older guys that kept, that just walked right into that role and, and continued to do that. Not all, not all uh, father figures have to provide genetic material. Was there anyone else with any questions or comments? No one else? Okay, sorry. 
Okay, so thank you so much, Joan, for your service today. Um, what you. I felt, what I felt was that you don't have to be a biological parent, biological parent in order to parent someone. And, you know, in that sense, I think we can all be potential parents. So thank you very much, Joan, and we look forward to seeing you again. Okay, bye-bye.